All right, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. I have a million questions and uh, we only have about 30 or 40 minutes today. So I'm going to go rapid fire. But first, before we get into entrepreneurship, uh, the Timberwolves and some of the stuff that you're working on today, I was doing research for this and I stumbled upon that you qualified on the U.S. bobsled team. What the hell is that all about? <laughs> How'd you find that? <laughs> it's on your Wikipedia page. Yeah, it was the uh, national bobsled team back in uh, 1996. Yeah, it was uh, just a random series of events that happened. Um, start starting with, you know, the the U.S. national bobsled team was in New York City for a week, basically to raise awareness for bobsledding. They had a track down at the World Financial Center, and uh, they encouraged people to go and push the sled, and they would time you. Um, and they had this thing that I wasn't really paying a lot of attention to that was like, oh, the fastest time of the week, we'll invite you up to Lake Placid. So uh, I get a call, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, and they said, hey, uh, did you push the sled down there? And I said, yeah. They said, you had the fastest time of the week. We'd like to invite you to Lake Placid. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> what, 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 what is that all about? You know, what do you do? And he's like, well, you come up to Lake Placid and then we're going to test you. We're going to test you strength, speed, agility, all this stuff. And, um, and if you pass the test, we'll train you to push the bobsled. And uh, so I said, okay. I went up there, did their testing. Um, and, and lo and behold, they said, yeah, you, uh, you had a great score and we want to train you for a month before the uh, time trials. And so I asked for a month off from work. I was in banking at the time and uh, basically trained up in Lake Placid. And, uh, and then we had the, the time trials, you know, where you had to push the sled, to try to qualify. And I just barely squeaked in and qualified for the national team. I would have had to travel for two years around the, around the world, uh, prior to the Olympics. And I chose not to do that. Uh, one, because I was three years into my career and was doing well and didn't want to disrupt that. And also, you know, uh, those two years, a lot could happen, you know, in terms of making the team. I had just squeaked, squeaked by onto the team, and it was probably unlikely I would be in a in a uh, a sled that would be contending for a medal there at the Olympics. So, so, so I got two questions quickly off of that. One, I was in banking. I used to work at J.P. Morgan. What the hell was the conversation like when you told them you need a month off to go train for bobsledding? <laughs> Fortunately, I had a good I had a good. Uh, you know, relationship with my, my boss there. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a funny kind of thing. And I basically, I knew that I like wasn't going to go up there for like a couple months. So I literally spent the next couple months basically pushing cars around parking lots you know, to, to train. I didn't know what to do. You know, I was like, all right, well, uh, so I basically did that for a couple months before. And uh, that was, that I, was uh, I recently climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania uh, and I don't oh, have a wow. hiking... Yeah, I don't have a hiking background at all. I'm from I'm from North Carolina, but I live in Miami now, right? And there's obviously uh, certainly no elevation, but no mountains either. <laughs> and uh, so I, I I tweeted out saying, "Hey, I'm going to go climb the mountain." It was for charity, and we were uh, installing water wells around in the region or whatever. But part of it is to you know, if you're going to raise money and ask for people to donate, you got to go do something that sucks. So <laughs> we, we we climbed the mountain, uh, but to train, people were laughing because. I basically just filled up my book bag with as much weight as I could find. And I would just climb stairs in the apartment building. I would go from the first floor to like the 60th floor and it's hot as hell in there. It's miserable. And it probably doesn't even prepare you that well, right? Like you can't really prepare for elevation by doing yeah. that. Uh, no, but, but I feel sure you got your quads and everything like in good, in good shape. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was a good workout for sure. Uh, but there's nothing like twenty thousand feet of elevation. I don't I don't care what you're doing, right? It's just it's different. Um, okay, that, that, that's a good start. <laughs> Let's talk about entrepreneurship. You are uh, fascinating, right? You've built multiple big businesses at this point. I think there's probably four or five at this point that have uh, you've successfully exited from. I know the pit that you sold for a few million dollars, and then everyone I think knows diapers.com uh, that you sold to Amazon. For over five hundred million dollars, and then Jet.com that was purchased by eBay or acquired by eBay for over three billion dollars. So, Mark, like just point blank, what makes you so successful at this in, in an industry that not many people succeed at? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything anything real special. It, it sort of uh, it involves a lot of hard work, um, the ability to sort of take risk, and then some luck, you know. And uh, when when something doesn't work out, you have to just get back up and uh and do it again but i do think it's the combination of of uh just you know incredibly hard work ethic and 
risk taking ability. So I think you need both and then you need luck on top of it. You know, that's, that's really what it takes. My experience is that one of the things stopping people is the ability that you mentioned to take risk, right? Most people are just risk adverse. They, they either uh, wait too long, right? And they don't have the ability to take the risk because they have family and kids and all these different things, or they're just more comfortable, you know, working nine to five and doing these jobs. Was that something that you always had? Or is that something that you think you grew into the ability to, to, to fail and take risk? Yeah, I know. I've always had it. And I think it's because I, I failed so much as a kid growing up. Um, my, my parents were sort of, uh, this laissez-faire, you know, just go and you'll, you'll figure everything out yourself. They weren't they were the opposite of helicopter parents. You know, they, they let me fail. They let me try things. And, and, and uh, I learned a lot from that. I also became very comfortable with failure. Like there was no pressure to get good grades. I didn't get good grades and my parents didn't care about it. You know, they thought, you know, a, a C was fine, just fine. You know, it was that sort of attitude. And uh, I don't know. I think it really helped me to, to, uh, be comfortable with, with failure. Of, of course, I did, never wanted to fail, but when you're comfortable with it and you know it's okay, it just allows you to, to take uh, outsized risks. I how do you think, of- I was just going to ask, how do you think about idea generation, right, for these startups and these companies? So is it just something of power law takes hold and you're looking for the biggest asymmetric opportunity, or is there some other kind of uh, criteria that, that needs to fit your, your bill to start a company? Yeah, I think it, it comes in all shapes and forms. I don't think there's any, any real formula. I think <clears throat> the, the idea is to be open, spend time thinking. I think, uh, uh, I think most people don't spend enough time, entrepreneurs, you know, thinking, just thinking, spend an hour a day thinking about ideas, thinking about the world, thinking about what's working, what's not working, what could be done better. Um, and then you'll get lots of ideas and some will stick and some won't. And the one that, that doesn't seem to go away is the one you should probably do, you know, and that's always happened with me. Lots of ideas in and out and, uh, and one of them, you know, just just stays kind of stays with me, and I can't shake it. You know, I can't find a reason not to do it. It's, it's sort of, um, and and that's certainly what happened with like, uh, you know, the last uh, startup for sure. What happened? Uh, what did people say to you, your friends and family, when you told them you were going to sell diapers online? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was. I, I remember I. Um, we, we had moved into a neighborhood in, in Mount Lakes, New Jersey, and my neighbor tells this story. It's really funny. At every campfire, you know, uh, that he met me in the driveway with his new neighbor, and he said, well, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, you know, I, I sell diapers over the Internet. He said he went back to his wife and said, hey, don't get too close to these guys. They're not going to be here that much longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that business may not be around. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, but- I would love. I would love just to, you know when diapers was, was really successful at, at some point towards the end there. I would love to just tell people you know when they ask me what I did, I just tell them you know I'm a diaper salesman. You know. Yeah, that's amazing. So off of that though, how much weight do you put? Uh, I don't know if like a specific number is necessary, or if you even think about it that way. But how much weight do you put in the actual idea behind a startup versus the execution? I mean, I, I've always said I think any idea can work. It's not about the idea, and it's all about execution. It's about execution. It's it's, it's VCP. It's vision capital people. You have to have a big vision um, for whatever idea it is, and it doesn't matter what it is. You need to be able to hire great people and raise capital. And if you can do that, uh, it could be a really big, successful business. I mean, people look back and say, wow, that was such a great idea, diapers.com. And I say, Really? Because <laughs> all we're doing is selling diapers over the internet. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the idea at all. And, uh, you know, I think it never is really. And, and I've seen great ideas fail and bad ideas work. And it, it always comes back to the, to the founder, the team, their ability to raise capital and, and sort of think big and, and shape that, that vision of the future. What was your process for raising capital early on? Uh, begging, basically, <laughs> you know, the very first startup, uh, there was, you know, we didn't raise any venture capital or anything like that. It Were you all worked. in at this point personally? Uh, that, well, that first startup, you know, I invested 390,000 into that startup. And, uh, I, I mean, investors would ask me, I just have a question here. It says 390,000. Why didn't you just invest 400? That's kind of a weird number. And I said, well, 
because I don't have 400. I only had 390,000 in my bank account and literally took the bank account and just boom, invested the whole thing. And yeah, I was all in, you can say. But but it's funny, it's it's self-fulfilling because being all in in that way, you know, built the confidence up of investors to say, wait, this guy can't fail. Like he can't afford to fail. He has to make this work. And I always try and in every startup put myself in a position where it has to work, where there's no like escape hatch, no plan B. It's you're all in. And that's the only way to to get the very best you've got, to get into that what I call sixth gear. Um, and so, yeah, the first investment was, um, 60, basically angel investors, each putting in like $80,000 on average or something like that. And it was, yeah, just knocking on doors and I didn't know anyone either. It wasn't like I was like, came from a wealthy family. I didn't know anyone wealthy. And it was like my boss at the bank where I quit and, you know, to do this, basically put in the first 50 and made a couple intros and from there, they made a couple intros and they made a couple intros and just basically this web started to build. And, uh, and eventually, you know, after after we got 60 investors on board, we had our $5 million of capital. And so, Does raising money from family and friends, do you think that's a, it sounds like you think that's a positive because it makes you somewhat uh, responsible, right? Is that correct? Yeah. I, I mean, because after I made, you know, the money at diapers.com, it wasn't for me about, you know, putting myself in a, in a position financially where I was going to be at, at risk. So I couldn't do that, you know, that same strategy, but bringing your aunts and uncles and parents and brothers and sister and your closest friends and taking their money, uh, and putting it into the business. Yeah. That that's even more pressure than personally having you know, your own finances in there. And so that was a, a big motivator and driver for not being able to fail. Gotcha. <laughs> and people, and I always, I'm always a little bit skeptical. Like when somebody starts a business, they don't put their own money in and they don't take their family or friends money or anything like that. I'm like, no, no, I just, I just don't want to, I just want institutional money. It's like, yeah. I mean, I, I understand why, because it puts a lot of pressure and this might not work and you may need to bail. And then you got, problem on your hands. And so I, I think it's important that you you're willing to sort of go to the mat. Um, I certainly look for that. Yeah. W athletes come on here all the time and I talk to, to many people offline. And one of the things they always ask is like, how should I know if I should invest in deals, right? Athletes are brought venture deals all the time and uh, they're trying to decipher kind of which ones are the good ones and which ones that they should do. And ultimately a lot of it comes down to just like, who's bringing me the deal one, but two, how much are they putting in? Right. If you're putting in a material amount of your own capital and it's something that you truly believe in, or even if you're starting the business as an entrepreneur and you're <clears> asking people for money, uh, I totally agree. It's it's super important to have skin in the game. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to know that the entrepreneur is all in. Um, and, and, a, and a second time entrepreneur or third time entrepreneur is just it's much, much safer bet. I think if you're if you're an athlete thinking about investing in a startup, um, and and also thinking about you know building a diversified portfolio too. It's not the chances of just picking one and that one working and becoming big is is probably low. But if you build a portfolio, find good founders, founders that had successful exits, um, and then you know even better if you can get into startups a little bit uh, later, like in the Series A when you've got well known venture capitalists coming in. I mean, if you're if you're a prominent you know athlete. That's probably what I would do because you'd be able to have access to those deals where most people wouldn't be able to and get into those A rounds with with uh, really good uh, venture capitalists behind it. Yeah. One of the things I always say is like, use your name to your advantage, right? Athletes, uh, good venture capitalists and big venture capitalists want to hang out with the best athletes in the world. They want to go to dinner with them. They want to go to games and want to do all these things. So use yeah. that to your advantage and, and try to get access to deal flow that you wouldn't always have. Um, but when it comes to, you're, you're obviously a serial entrepreneur at this point, you founded multiple companies and found success multiple times. How has previous success helped you when you started new businesses, right? Have you been able to take learnings and just hit the ground running and go from zero to one immediately? Yes. Yeah. I mean, every time I do a new startup, and I have a new startup right now called Wonder. And uh, with each startup, you, yeah, it becomes easier uh, to raise capital, easier to hire people because you've got a track record. So that makes it, that makes it, you know, uh, have improves your chances quite, quite a lot, but also you learn, you learn, you do things differently. Um, 
that experience of, of getting starting a company, exiting a company, and all the things in between to be able to do that multiple times. Each time you're improving your skills, you're getting better. Um, it's it's one of the it's unlike you know athletes, you know you sort of get better with age with this stuff. Um, I'm sure it's I guess I'm, I'm sure at some point it'll it'll sort of go the other way, but uh, for now it's it's still uh, you know still in that growth phase. You touch on hiring, and that's one of the things I think a lot about because entrepreneurs in general, and certainly those specifically that are running high growth companies that are that are scaling fast, run into the problem of like you just can't hire enough good people fast enough. How do you deal with that at, at all the startups that you've built? Like, how do you think about finding the right people, and how do you think about actually interviewing them to hire the right people? Yeah, so a couple things. One, um, it's important I think early on if you want to scale to get a really good chief people officer. I think people don't put, that's one of the things I've learned over time is the importance of the chief people officer. Like that is, is got to be one of your first and, and biggest hires. And I think a lot of people think about it, human resources. They don't think about it as chief people officer. This person is going to help you recruit and retain the very best people. And especially if you're moving fast, you want somebody there that can build a, a recruiting staff and, and build that culture right from day one. Um, so I'd say that's really important. The other thing is to build a compensation system that allows you to scale fast. And so at the last two companies, basically built a comp system where everyone sort of at the same level makes the same amount of money um, and a, a way to calculate how much stock options you should give each person at each level. And then as the company grows in value, a formula to very quickly adjust how many stock options the new person should get relative to the, the person before based on how the company's increasing in valuation. Building sort of that comp system in the beginning so you don't have to like think about every person you hire. Well, how many options should we give them? What's fair? Oh, we hired this person at this amount. We hired that person at that amount. And try, it's very messy as opposed to having a system where everybody you hire at any time, you know exactly what the comp is. Uh, I'm hiring a director today. It's 10,000 options. I'm hiring a director, you know, a year from now, it's 7,000 options. A year later, it's 3,000 options. Like you, you you plug in basically the value of the company and it will spit out a number of options. So I think compensation system is important. And then on interviewing, uh, interview time is valuable and you, you want to have a high hit rate on interview. And so I spend a lot more time now on resume reading. Um, than interviewing. I think in the beginning startups, you just, you get us some resumes and you're like, yeah, let me talk to this person. They have the relevant experience. And then you bring them in. And then a lot of times you get honeypotted. Uh, I call it honeypot. Basically, you just get on with the person and you're like, oh, you, you did this experience. I've got a great conversation in this hour. I like you. And then boom, you hire them. And what I've learned from experience is that's probably the worst thing you could possibly do. It also leads to unconscious bias too. Um, and so it's not great for, for, for diversity and things like that. But, um, now I, I, I know that the resume tells the true story and I focus a lot more on the resume. And when the interview time comes, I'm already inclined to hire the person based on their experience. It's really about, uh, core value fit and culture fit at that point. But, uh, when you read a resume, uh, I'm looking for people that have a, um, basically a certain level of, of success in every job that they've had. And so I look at that, like, what have you done? How many years have you been there? And, and what have you done there? Um, and then most important is what move did you make? When you left that job, did you go to a better company with a better position? Did you go lateral? Did you go and to a, a, a higher position in a lower company? You know, did you go from Amazon, Amazon and then you go to Sears? That, that to me would, would raise the flag. Um, if you go to Google and you leave there in 18 months and go to a company that I've never heard of, that also is a red flag. There's things like that. And every resume tells a story and every resume is different. It's certainly more an art than a science. But if you just put yourself in the person's shoes, like right out of college and say, okay, assume I'm a superstar, get into the person's head, take that first job. You're a superstar, right? What did you do there? And then when you, you moved, was that the move of a superstar? Does that make sense? And you can see that you know, this is not going to be able to you know, figure out whether somebody's in the 40th percentile or the 60th percentile. But if you're looking for top 10% talent, like, like I always am, 
then you can. There are certain patterns, top 10 percenters, their resumes look a certain way. Um, and it's the, it's, the, it's the consistent degree of success and upward movement um, that, that jumps out off the page uh, every time. If everything else was equal in the equation and you were presented with two people that uh, one had better technical skills, right, could could actually do the job better, but the other one was much better from a mission standpoint, they actually believed in the business and believed in the company, which one would you go with? I'd always go with the mission-oriented person. Um, <clears throat> in fact, you know, because as a startup, you sort of have to pick. You can't get somebody with the relevant experience and then also like exhibit all the, the traits I look for, smart, passionate, optimistic, tenacious, adaptable, kind, and empathetic, my spotic traits. So I'm looking, I'm looking at somebody with those traits and then trying to find somebody with those traits and the experience and, you know, good cultural fit is impossible, especially early on. Those people are too expensive. And so you have to pick one or the other. And I've had a lot of success basically by bringing people into the organization that don't actually have the relevant experience but they've got the right traits, the right attitude, they're mission oriented, and they're willing to, to run through a wall to, to sort of uh, you know, help the company succeed. And you know, very quickly, those people that they're smart, passionate, they got the right attitude, they will learn um, the, the function. And then a year or two years later, they wind up being one of the experts in that, in that field. You know? And so yep. I call it best available athlete. In terms of when you're when you're recruiting people, too many people I think make the mistake of going with experience before anything else. They, oh, you you've done this before. This is what I'm looking for. Great, and you bring them in, and those people a lot of times you know just they'll, they'll be good the first few months because you you know they've got it brought it bring experience you don't have or know, but then you outgrow them really fast and you're kind of stuck. Yeah, I think people probably don't think about this uh, enough today, given all the success that you've had. But I'm sure you've dealt with self doubt at times, right, in the past, and and people that didn't believe in you or your mission or your vision. How do you deal with that today? Yeah, I mean, it's still, still to this day, as experiences I am raising capital. You know, um, I've got a ten percent hit rate. You know, like I'll talk to 50, 50 venture capital investors and only five will want to invest. Um, and, and why is that? Because your idea is so out there or it's something else? There's always just lots of factors. Uh, it's timing, where they are in the, in the, in the cycle of their fund, um, whether it's the right stage, um, whether it's the right valuation, whether it's the right sector that they're focused on. Like there's all kinds of things and, and they may all agree, hey, like, we, we, we love the team. We think the idea is big. It's a big market. You guys have great progress, you know, showing great results, but it's not, but they don't invest. And I think people don't really understand because I, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs that they'll talk to like five or six, you know, give five or six pitches and they get no's and they kind of like get down and they change their, they change their deck. They change, they're like, well, those six people that said no said they would invest if we did X. Not really. They just say that, but then you change it, and then you you go out again, and then you, you get six more no's, and they tell you to change it a different way, and then you change it again. And I think it's so important that basically you can you have that clear vision and strategy, and you know exactly where you're going, how you're going to get there. And don't let any venture capitalist in a one hour pitch change your mind or have you change your deck. Um, once you start changing your deck, you're lost. Forget it. You don't know who you are, where you're going, you're just following sort of the, 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 the wind, you know, and um, that doesn't work. And so be prepared. If, you, if you're looking to raise institutional venture capital, be prepared and get set up to have, you know, 50 plus meetings. Every time I've raised money, I've had at least, you know, sort of 50 uh, pitch, pitch meetings, uh, pitch decks that, I, that I've gone through. Um, so... How many times do you think you've been told no throughout your career? I was thinking about this. I've done, I've done now thirteen rounds of venture capital financing. I've had so I probably pitched, you know, call it five hundred times or something. Um, and uh, my hit rate is 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 less than ten percent for sure. You want to be nice, ten percent. That's four hundred and fifty no's, <laughs> you know, over my career, and. Uh, 
And this is, you know, this is even the second time founder, third time founder, still getting the nose. It's not something, you know, my hit rate is, is definitely better than it was the first time. Um, I think the first time was maybe like one out of 50, you know, and it was like, we, we got that one investor after 50 pitches. Um, but it's tough raising, there's nothing tougher than raising money, uh, for a startup and an entrepreneur. And that's why I always tell people like raise as much money as you can. People say, Oh, I don't want the dilution. I can raise more now. There is good and bad markets. Sometimes the markets are flush with cash and it's easy to raise money. And sometimes it's impossible. And I think a lot of founders don't don't really appreciate that, especially in good times. And you know, companies don't fail for any other reason than they run out of capital. There's no there's no other. You you never fail. You never you're never done until you don't have capital. And so, capital is a, is a is a rare and, and precious resource. If you can raise it, take it, and don't worry about the dilution because you should have enough confidence in yourself to at least increase the valuation of the company by more than the dilution. Okay. So you take an extra 10% dilution, big deal. You have, you have all this extra capital, just increase the valuation by more than 10% uh, from what it would have been had you not raised the capital. It's always easy math. It's never, it never doesn't pay to raise capital unless you just simply can't do anything with it. Like, okay, if I'm going to take all this capital, I don't know what to do with it. Okay. Then, then don't raise it. But if you, if you have a reason and a good place to invest it, take it. Don't worry about the dilution. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I would love to talk a little bit about the Minnesota Timberwolves and, and the Lynx. So uh, I think everyone knows at this point that yourself and Alex Rodriguez bought or in the process of, of transitioning ownership of both of those teams. Uh, I think you bought them for $1.5 billion or something around there. When I think about sports teams, uh, obviously growing up as a sports fan, and, and you did also, like this was always uh, just something that really, 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 really rich people did, right? Just for fun. Uh, but it's also turned into a pretty good investment. Also, we've seen these teams appreciate all, a lot in value over the last few years. Uh, some people believe this will continue to happen with sports betting and streaming and all these other uh, uh, tailwinds happening. But how much of this is just fun for you versus, hey, uh, this is a really good investment also? Yeah. So most of the things in life that are that are fun that have to do with 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 money and investing usually don't yield good returns. So I, I've I've been there with with two things, <laughs> uh, you know, buying racehorses, for example, fun, not a place to <laughs> make money. And, and, you know, you're told going into horse racing. You're going to buy, you better love the sport because you're not going to make money. How so, does the business of horse racing work? Like just at a high level. At a high level. At a high level, you basically you can you can buy some yearlings at the yearling sale, like that have pedigree, you know, and you sort of buy them. Um, you give them to a stable. Uh, you get a trainer. The stable can get a trainer. They'll train the horse. They'll do everything. They'll put it in into races that it makes sense to race, and then you get a percentage of the purse if they win. But meanwhile, you're paying you know thousands of dollars every month to to, to the stable. And you look at the purses at the end of the year and you look at how much you paid and it's always, almost always upside down. Um, every once in a while, I guess you get that home run, you know, like that one, one in, a, in, in a million. But uh, for most horses, uh, you're upside down. And it's fun. You go to the races. You know, I grew up in Staten Island, New York, and my uncles, and dad, and everyone, they, they will all, always bring me to the track as a little kid. And you learn how to, you know, uh, read the book and, and bet on the horses and things. It was sort of just a thing grew up with that was fun and so i thought you know why not you know take it to the next level and have some fun but it's it's it increases the fun level but it definitely decreases the the the, the pocketbook so uh that's one the other thing that that also drains money is a vineyard um i tried that too i, I love red wine thought it would be so cool you know own a vineyard and uh no that that pretty much loses money too um and why are those so difficult to run i mean if you would have buy a proper, probably large scale operating business that generates a profit. Yeah. But if you just want to buy like a boutique vineyard and, and throw out a few hundred cases of wine a year, that's not, that's not going <laughs> to, it's not going to make any money and it's not, it's not a good investment. So I was sort of blown away by, by the NBA, uh, you know, teams that are increasing in value because I'm like, wait a second, this is like, inc could it be incredibly fun and I could actually make money, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and that's what that's what 
is so great about owning an NBA team. It literally is going up 10, 15% a year, and it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. So it's a great investment, great place to, to put capital. But at the same time, you know, what's more fun than a, than a sports fan, you know, uh, having the opportunity to, to, to be an owner and, and uh, you know, be involved in, in helping shape the team? Yeah, one of the uh, stories I always think back when in regards to kind of the fun versus the investment when it comes to sports teams is is Chamath uh, Papalatia, right? He said, uh, I think I forget the numbers, so excuse me if they're wrong, but essentially he had started his his investment firm and had put almost every dollar that he had into it. Uh, but he had some, you know, a few million dollars of, of cash left aside and he was looking for a diversified asset that had basically no correlation to anything else he was doing. And he was like, uh, eh, you know, a sports team is probably a decent investment. And he got the opportunity to invest in the Warriors. And this was, you know, before the Warriors valuation went up higher than any team in the NBA. Uh, and it ended up probably being one of his best investments. And to your point, he probably had a lot of fun. Now, he wasn't the the majority owner, so uh, a little bit different, but I'm sure he was attending games. He probably got, you know, a championship ring or whatever it is. Uh, so, so, like, to me, that's amazing if you can combine the two, right, the entertainment and the fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's It really is a dream dream come true. I mean... Uh, ever since being a little kid and realizing, well, you weren't going to play professional sports. <laughs> so, is there any uh, like low hanging fruit when you guys get in and see the business and say, "Hey, maybe things uh, here or there we could increase and make better immediately. We could do the fan experience a little bit differently, or anything like that." Yeah, we're going through a process now, sort of building the foundation. It's called uh, Vision Capital People VCP. I have this framework that I've I've built to go into the exercise of, of what is the vision, what is the strategy, what's the, the mission of the organization, the values, you know, putting together a, a, a proper plan and, and the right organizational structure. So we're going through all that and we're almost complete with that. And there'll definitely be some, some changes that will happen over time um, as we build on, on this foundation. But I also think simultaneously, sometimes, and I've learned this in, in business, you, the tendency is to want to come in and, and make changes, make things happen. Um, it, it, most people, I think, move too quickly. I think it's really important to be thoughtful, build the foundation, and do things in the right order. It's the right order meaning you need to know who you are, what are your values, what do you stand for, what traits are you looking for in people that you bring into the organization? Like, who are you? What's your what's the DNA? And if you start hiring people before you know who you are, you m- might not find people that are a great fit. And so you have to go through that exercise, and it's a lot of work to do the heavy lifting. And then and only then would you uh, bring new people into the organization. Um, I also think there's an importance in in having continuity. I think one of the reasons why why teams never seem to to sort of do well. Um, you know, I used to be a big Knicks fan, and and that was certainly very frustrating. You know, uh, over over the years, and there always seems to be change, constant change, moving out of GM, moving out of coach, just in general, not not calling out the Knicks specifically, just in general, m- moving in and out and. And I think there's uh, incredible value in, in continuity of, of coaching, general manager, the players, like building that, that, that true team where people feel bonded and feel a sense of purpose and, and know that it's not mercenary. It's not just dollars and cents. It's not just, you know, uh, a revolving door, but there's, you're building something together that's special and that's going to stand the test of time. And I think that's really important. And if we were to look uh, at the NBA as a league from a valuation perspective 10 years from now, what in your mind is the biggest driver of valuations going forward? Is it private equity firms now investing and expanding the the kind of demand? Is it streaming and betting? Is it overseas expansion? Just maybe like a few ideas that you think are really powerful there. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you said it, overseas expansion, I think is, a, is definitely a big part of it. Um, I think just the growth, the popularity of the sport around the world is growing at a pretty good clip. Uh, it's a progressive league. It's diverse. Um, it's forward thinking. Adam's doing a great job. And uh, I do think it ultimately at the end of the day, it's about um, uh, the, the growth in the sport globally. I, mean, I think that's, that's what it really comes down to um, really driving top line revenues. And uh, that ultimately drives valuations. 
Gotcha. So you've mentioned vision capital people a few times now. Uh, and for those that don't know, you you and Alex started a venture capital firm also with the same name. Uh, and you guys are investing in early stage companies. What exactly are you guys investing in? Yeah, so the, the concept is, is pretty simple. It's We felt there was a, a void in the venture market as entrepreneurs where there's a little bit of this chicken egg thing where you're an entrepreneur, you have a big vision and you're looking for seed capital and you raise a million dollars. Well, you can't really do a lot. You can't hire the very best people um, because you don't have the money. And so you wind up hiring people, but they're not as good as they would be if you had the capital. And it sort of becomes self-fulfilling in some ways that and, and becomes riskier. And so we want to take that risk off the table and basically give founders with big ideas that we have the ability to, to execute $10 million of seed capital. It's this idea of go big early. And so you get $10 million of seed, and we expect you to, to use that capital to hire the very best team in the world in that area um, to give you a big advantage over any, any of your competition doing something similar in a similar area because you've got a better team. You've got the capital to build an incredible product. Um, and then that kind of sets you up uh, with an incredible team, incredible product for a, a really big Series A round, call it $50 million. Um, and then with that 50 million that we VCP would help you know, kick off with, let's say 20, will help you bring in other investors. Now you've ha- now you've got 60 million dollars and that 50 to to basically take this great team, this great product, and start to blow it out. And we think that we could help make winners. That if you have a great founder and a big idea, it should work. It's usually capital and the people that hold it back. And so if you have capital, it allows you to hire great people and give you the best chance of winning. And it doesn't need to be where only three in, in 10 investments work as a venture capital firm. We believe they could all work um, with, with the right person in the right area with the right amount of capital. And so that's what that's what it's about. So even in today's uh, crazy market, $10 million seed round is obviously still big. I'm assuming you guys are acquiring a larger percentage of the company than than normal at that stage. Yes. That's obviously different than the traditional model. Uh, why do you think that that will work compared to something else? Again, I think because most of these businesses that, that fail, they fail because they don't have enough capital and they're undercapitalized. And as a result, they're not able to hire the very best people. And so it could be like a a great market, a growing, it's got tailwinds, it's got a good founder, but just because you don't have the capital, you take shortcuts, you don't invest in the product the way maybe you would have. Uh, you don't hire the, the very best people. And I just feel like that's the only reason why those businesses don't work. They should all work. If it's like a big growing TAM with tailwinds, great industry, it's hot. You got a great experienced founder. That should work like every single time. It's the only reason why it doesn't is capital and people. And so here's the capital. There's no excuses. You've got 60 million. You don't have to worry about raising capital. You have to just focus on the business. You can hire the very best people. So now let's compare to other startups in the space. You've got the capital. You've got the better people. You're a great founder, and you're in this incredible market. Who's going to win? And, and even, if you, even if you don't necessarily win, it's unlikely you're going to lose. And anytime I see any startup that's where it lost, it sort of made bad decisions because it didn't have capital, hired bad people because it didn't have capital. And so we want to make the winners, basically. Um, and I think that's it. If we own a high percentage of the company, somewhere between 40 and 60% of the company will own coming out of the A round. That A round is done, you know, 50 million. It's going to be at a 100 million plus pre-money. And that we own 50 to 60% of it. The next stop is a multi-hundred million dollar valuation on your way to a billion. And so I do think... Um, the probability of getting to a unicorn is, is, is so much higher, um, having that capital and a, and a great team in the right market. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of taking a playbook out of a uh, page out of the playbook that, that I've used in my own startups, you know, whether it be diapers, jet, now wonder, um, even, even helping the guys at Archer, the, the EB tall company that went public two years after it was founded. Um, it's it, there, there is uh, a playbook here that allows you to 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 grow big fast. Gotcha. I think that makes a lot of sense. Off of that, what industries or trends are you super excited about right now? 
Um, I'm certainly really excited about about Wonder and the trend we're in, um, you know, the food space. And I so think, explain what Wonder is for people who don't know. Yeah, it's basically we're creating uh, next generation of restaurant chains. Basically, we, we created a a mobile platform. Um, it's basically a a van, a Mercedes Sprinter van with a built in kitchen, and we're building restaurant chains from the ground up that exist only on this mobile platform. Um, and we've created 17 restaurant chains, everything from steak, steakhouse, all the way down to pizza and burgers and everything in between Japanese, Chinese. Imagine pulling up the Wonder app um, and, and being able to access 17 of these restaurant chains that are mobile that will literally pull up outside your door in about 10 minutes, cook the food so it's really high quality, piping hot, and deliver it to your door. Um, so that that's really, that's Wonder in a nutshell. Um, and we're live in 17 towns in New Jersey and yeah, it's doing really well. Customers, um, you know, love the service and, uh, obviously much better than food delivery because the food is piping hot. You can get hot French fries, you can get a steak, you can get a, a, a grilled piece of salmon and, uh, it's all cooked right there outside your door. And we've done it. We do it in a high speed impingement oven. It's like a convection oven on steroids. So we're actually cooking the food, but it cooks really fast. We can cook four pizzas simultaneously in three to four minutes. Um, so that's part of the magic of Wonder is we spent the last three and a half years doing food science and food engineering to be able to cook this incredible quality food fast in a truck with someone who is low skilled, low trained. You don't need to be a chef to be able to cook the food really high quality. Um, so that that's sort of the that's that's one that's Wonder in a nutshell. And you guys have exclusive deals with chefs, right? If I'm not mistaken, where you have their menus and, and whatnot on there also, right? Yeah. So we, we went around the U.S. and found sort of the best restaurants and the best chefs. And we struck a deal where we would buy the rights to use the name uh, and use the menu. Um, but we'd, we'd have to build these restaurants from the bottom up to be able to go onto the mobile platform. So it's vertically, vertically integrated. Um, we'll really you know, give a stock and cash up front to these chef partners. Um, you know, we've got some great, great partners. Um, Bobby Flay, uh, is our Bobby Flay steakhouse. You know, we've got Nancy Silverton, Pizzeria Moza from, from out near LA, uh, Marcus Samuelson, Jose Andres, um, just some great, some great chefs, some great places. Um, gotcha. And how do you think about investing your personal capital? Obviously, uh, you've done well and you've exited some of these businesses. You, you've bought assets also, uh, and you have your own venture capital firm and you're investing a lot. But how, how do you think about personal asset allocation? Yeah, I'm, I don't really like to complicate life too much and get in too many different classes. I, um, it's basically you know, three, three things, really. It's sort of have money in, in cash, um, have uh, money in my existing startup that I'm all in and focused on, like Wonder. So I invested quite a bit in that company because I believe it could be a, a really big, successful business. Um, and and then it's putting money into the venture capital firm. So all the investments that that I've made sort of outside of VCP are sort of becoming part of the VCP um, venture fund so that I don't have all this miscellaneous stuff out there. Like, I think when you have like investments in a lot of different asset classes and a lot of different things, then you, then you need a family office and that adds complexity and time. And I like to be really focused. So I want to spend, you know, all my time basically on, on my existing startup and then, and then the, the venture capital fund. So that's how I sort of think about it. And Obviously, what, the team, and then, and the team too, but that's not from a, from an investment standpoint, I don't really think about that. It's, how, how does that work, by the way? Is there just like, uh, I think I asked you this when we met the first time, but along the lines of like, how did you figure out what to pay? Was that a long process? And then do you just literally like wire them hundreds of millions of dollars or is that is that done differently? <laughs> you mean the team? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it actually happened faster than we could have imagined it. I think Alex and I were, hey, do you want to meet Glenn Taylor, Minnesota Timberwolves? And at that point we had, lost the bid to buy the mats and we were kind of depressed and um we weren't like completely ready um to get into a new relationship <laughs> you know we were we were sort of uh, after we were dumped um and so we, we, were, we weren't really like fired up and like oh wow this is going to be incredible we're going to 
buy an NBA team now. We said, you know, we'll, we'll take the meeting. Um, and we met with Glenn and Becky and I don't know, we just really hit it off and it sounded really fun. And we just connected with them in a way that got us fired up. We went from zero to a hundred in like a few hours. And Alex and I both looked at each other and were like, you want to do this? And we're like, yeah, let's, 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 let's go for it. And I don't know, a few days later, we had signed the LOI and it was just, it all happened so fast. It was, um, it was pretty incredible. Um, you know, we, we had, uh, we had heard that it would be tough to get a deal done, uh, because, you know, uh, others have had, uh, you know, a hard time getting a deal done with, with Glenn and Becky, but I think we just took a very different, you know, um, path. You know, we weren't mercenary private equity guys like coming in, trying to like get at the lowest possible price. You know, I think Glenn and Becky had said, you know, this is the price we're looking for. And, you know, we thought it was fair. Um, and so we just said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do it for that price. We didn't, we didn't negotiate at all. Um, and I think the, most people say, you know, how can you not negotiate? That's, that seems crazy. I'm sure you left money on the table. And, you know, my answer there is, you know, sometimes the, the best way to negotiate is to know when not to negotiate. Um, and this is one of those cases where it was a fair deal and it is a, a, a prized, you know, sort of, there's only 30 of these teams in, in, in the NBA. Um, and felt like it was fair and, um, there was it was not the time to negotiate, and so that's kind of how it how it got done. Mark, I am part of a uh, investment group that is buying a small uh, League Two team in Europe, a soccer club, and uh, they they trade for like five million dollars. And the process to buy it, uh, it's going to be announced soon, but has taken like six or seven months <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and uh, I love the fact. So I love the fact that you guys bought a, a $1.5 billion team uh, in, in days uh, when it came to negotiation and everything like that. So that's incredible. Um, th the last thing I want to talk about is just your general thoughts on what's happening in crypto, right? Have you spent any time looking at Bitcoin or any of the other assets or, or even any businesses from a venture capital perspective that are that are in the market? Yeah, no, I've definitely I've definitely looked at it and, and helped uh, Michael Rubin and team create the NFT company Candy as well. So, yeah, I've definitely had my hands in it. I haven't I don't own any uh, Bitcoin. Um, I still a, a little bit. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just as an investment. I like the blockchain. I think there's a future for that technology. I think it's there's so many use cases, but I also think there's a little bit of a, of a bubble happening. Um, I think um, I've just seen, I guess, too many too many times. You know, without it, without a clear way to to value it from an intrinsic value standpoint, I just find it too hard to to get it to the market. I mean, you you need to be able to definitively say like this is what it's worth based on these underlying fundamentals and i can't do that and so i shy away even though it, it could go up it could double it could triple it could keep going um it's just not something that I, I typically would engage in yeah and i think it goes back to your other point uh also which is like you know what you're really good at and you're going to focus your time energy and effort on that and yes. there's no reason to involve all these other asset classes and all these other things yeah. um so last question one of the sponsors of this show is Eight Sleep, who I work with a lot. So I want to ask about uh, your sleep routine because it's one of the things I'm always fascinated about. They have a, uh, it's essentially a thermoregulated bed. So it gets super cold, it gets super hot. I've been using it for about a year now. What is your sleep routine? Do you sleep eight hours, less than eight hours, more than eight hours? And how has that changed throughout the years? Yeah, so I always have slept eight hours. I need eight hours sleep and to be like high energy for the other 16. So I'm not one of these guys that I don't understand how people do when they say I sleep five, five and a half hours a night. I don't, I don't, I don't get that. I love my sleep. Um, so yeah, I sleep eight hours. Um, the temperature needs to be like 67, 66 degrees. Otherwise I'll overheat. So I think you know, getting the temperature right is really important. I think having a great sleep and I use the Fitbit to track sleep every night. And so I'm, I'm sort of addicted to that sleep score and just sort of trying to understand what things impact you know, your REM sleep or your, your resting heart rate and things like that. And it's unbelievable 
how correlated it is to drinking alcohol. I mean, alcohol is the worst possible thing. And the closer you drink it to sleeping, the worse your sleep will be. And if I drink it at three or four in the afternoon, which is my new thing now, it's like, okay, you know, I don't want to mess up my sleep. I'm going to like, you know, drink at four in the afternoon, you know, so it's out of my system by the time I sleep, which is pretty funny. But um, yeah, it uh, sleep's so important, you know, and and uh, in terms of energy and your ability to, to sort of do everything you need to get done during the day. So. I love that. I'm going to have to try the uh, happy hour at 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. <laughs> and see how long I can get away with that. But no, it's it's certainly true. I uh, I wear a Whoop, which is similar to Fitbit and kind of attracts a lot of that stuff. Uh, and the biggest realizations is they ask you every morning when you wake up, right? Did you have any alcohol? Did you share your bed? Did you have stress? You know, like all the things that you would go through. Did you look at your phone in bed? Uh, and it makes a huge difference. And I had the CEO, Will Ahmed, on the podcast, and he he said something that uh, i always remember, which is basically like everyone he meets, if they're not getting four to five hours of deep sleep, right? Not just Not just sleep, but like actual deep sleep where uh, human growth hormone is being replaced and you're dreaming and you're doing these things, he knows they're not happy, right? They're not in a good mood. They're not uh, energetic or any of that stuff. And he can tell almost immediately. And I thought that was super powerful because one, this guy has spent his life and career trying to build a business around improving performance. Uh, So when he says something like that, you have to take note. Um, But yeah, I think it's just one of those things that like you realize is more important over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Mark. Food, too. food and sleep. Those are the two things. What do you, what do you do for food? Oh, well, wonder, obviously, but like, <laughs> what, yeah, what, what is, what has changed about your, your diet? I mean, just, I mean, it just so happens that I, my stomach doesn't do well with like dairy and gluten. And so I've been gluten and dairy free for a long time. And I think, so it just, you know, and I don't eat really very much, you know, uh, meat outside of uh, chicken and, 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 and fish really. You know, so, do you fast? Do you do intermittent uh, fasting? Not on purpose, but I sort of, you know, the goal is always to stop eating around, you know, seven, seven thirty, Um, and then I don't really eat anything until usually noon the next day, but not, not purposeful, but that is sort of like, I guess, intermediate fasting, you know, yeah. um, I think it's important yeah, not to eat. The other thing is that really affects your sleep is eating too late, a big meal, like trying to stop, not eat anything, um, at least 12 hours before you're going to wake up. You know, that's always the, the good, good rule of thumb. And that served me well. All right. Last question. Has your, uh, how's your basketball game these days now that you're uh, an owner? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's funny. I, I, uh, about six months ago, hired a, a professional NBA development coach, Phil Beckner, to basically teach me how to play because I was a big sports person, but I didn't play basketball. Funny enough, growing up, I played every other sport. And so um, I thought if I'm going to own a team, I probably should learn how to play. So I started that six months ago and was just got addicted to it. Um, and until my knees really started to break down, uh, it's not like at 50 years old, you can't be playing basketball four or five days a week. Um, but I, but I'm really into it and it's fun. And, and, you know, just, if nothing else, just learning the game, you know, so when you watch the game, I watch it with a different perspective now because you're just learning more about, uh, what it takes to, to play. I feel like I'm going to log on Twitter one day and see a, see a video of you and Alex playing one-on-one or something like that uh, <laughs> pop up. Well, I had this in the back of my head. You know, I played two-on-two with Joel Embiid uh, that m- many years ago, and he called me the worst basketball player he's ever seen. And I'm like, listen, dude, I, I've never played basketball, so like, give me a break. But uh, it stuck in the back of my head as – you know, not wanting to be labeled as the worst basketball player anyone's ever seen before, even if it is Joel Embiid. And so, you know, I'm sure now if I was to play, uh, I would still be bad, but certainly not the worst <laughs> he's ever seen. Yeah, you just want to be above that level, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah it, you know, it, I mean, I'm okay to be a bad player, but the worst he's ever seen, <laughs> that was too much for me. Yeah, I guess it helps a little bit that, you know, he's a he's an NBA all star. Uh, but that's hilarious. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I know you could be doing a million different things with your time. So thanks for jumping on here for an hour. Thanks, and we'll we'll have to do it again soon. Okay, take care. 